Welcome everybody to the Resilient Minds podcast. I'm super excited to sit here with you with the creator of Dream Think Do podcast, Mitch Matthews. Welcome to the show, my brother. My man, I, I love it. I'm honored. I'm excited for our conversation. Me too, brother. And I want everyone to know the magic of you, what you bring to the world and how how you've been, you know, cultivating this wisdom for so many years now. So for those that yeah. don't know, Mitch is a success coach. He's a speaker. He's been a, a serial entrepreneur, but really, he really wants to help people around the world to dream bigger, think bigger, and do more of what they were here to create, be created to do. Uh, his podcast has been rated number one by the Huffington Post and is one percent of all podcasts so not just that he's really focused as this elite success coach he spent the last two decades helping major organizations like nike united airlines nasa and disney he's built a successful business training program that has helped thousands around the world to really become this next generation success coaches so you're an amazing husband, your dad, a lifelong learner, and I'm really excited to get to know more about you and the magic that you bring to the world, my brother. Thanks, Eric, brother. I mean, I appreciate it. I love it. I just had you on my show and we could have kept going for four hours. So I'm glad we got the excuse to just keep the convo going, man. Right. That's right. I know it's it's amazing how we're able to... and continue that journey right because uh, you know right. we have to spend some time together but for us on the resilient mind bro i really am fo so focused about our experiences and i know yeah. that you know we briefly touched on you know your accolades but i know there's so much more depth to that and right our experience continue to navigate our big whys our big responsible yeah. roles in this world and I'd love to know, like, what was more about that defining moment that made you say, hey, you know, I really got to take this energy within myself or this awareness within myself and share it uh, so that, you know, I'm, I'm allowing others to step up as well. Yeah, I love it. Well, I think I think our journey is actually, you know, um, when somebody's on my show, I always say I do enough research where I stay just this side of stalker, you know, like just this side of restraining order. So as I found out more about you, I'm like, man, we've got a lot of similarities. So uh, I know you went down the track of finances and accounting and figured out, whoops, this isn't the right thing. I went down the track post-college of getting into the pharmaceutical world. And uh, so as my uh, older son told his kindergarten teacher, my dad sells drug drugs out of the trunk of his car, <laughs> which was accurate, but just not quite, not quite right. But, uh, anyway, I had a lot of success in the pharma world, uh, really enjoyed it when I first got into it, but the industry started to change. I started to work through the ranks and I am grateful now, uh, to say that I got promoted into a bad fit job. Um, and although it was really painful at the time, like, uh, you know, every day you drive to work, a little part of your soul is dying. Um, I look back and I am so grateful for that season because it woke me up to help me know this is not where I'm supposed to spend the rest of my days. Now, some people are made for it. Some people are made to sell. Some people are made to lead. Some people you know, are incredible in it, that industry and they should absolutely be there. Just wasn't my story. And that bad fit job woke me up and helped me to realize that, that I'm not supposed to be doing this anymore. Um, and I'm very grateful to my bride because on one evening I came home and it would have been a really particularly bad day. And I was broken in spirit and she brought out this business magazine and she said, you need to read this article because I think you need to do this. And I looked at the article and it was about an entrepreneur that was having incredible success. And I'm like, mm. but I, I wasn't really interested in what this entrepreneur was doing, the industry he was in or any of that. And she's like, no, 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 not him. Read the sidebar. And there was this sidebar article on this successful entrepreneur's coach. 
And to be perfectly honest, I didn't really even know coaching existed like this back in 2000, 2001. And I, you know, I, I had heard the term life coach, but I really wasn't sure what it, what, what it was. But my wife said, you do that with people. You ask people questions all the time. You encourage people, you help people to vision and plan. She's like, what if you could do that for a job? And I was like, I don't know. So I just started to experiment. I started to go down that track. I started to get some training. I, I leaned into it, started to do it on the side. And I thought it might take me five, six, seven years to launch and, and, you know, replace my income in the pharmaceutical world. And I'm wildly blessed to say that through some divine breakthroughs and a lot of hard work, we're able to launch a full-time coaching and speaking business in about five months and I've been doing it ever since, which is incredible. And I just, I'm so grateful for that season where my, my flame almost went out because it's a part of what makes me like burn, but it's a part of what wakes me up in the morning. Cause I think about the person that is in that position. Cause I looked successful. I looked happy. I looked like I was achieving, but I was dying. And those people are the people that wake me up in the morning because I believe everybody's here for a reason and multiple reasons. And I just want people to live at their best, you know, th at the highest levels and live their best life. And a lot of people aren't there. So that's that's one of the things that wakes me up in the morning. It's amazing. And I think, you know, there's so many people that can resonate with that because at the end of the day, the most important thing is to know that you can create it. You can make it happen. And yeah. So- what is it that, you know, when, with regards to the experience of this growth of seeing the success and uh, navigating the level of certainty by bringing your energy to the world in terms of coaching vision, yeah. bringing that level of intelligence to organizational culture, how are you finding or how did you find at that time and how are you now currently continue finding yourself to really continue to grow and expand. Yeah. Um, that's, I love that. And I love this conversation. I'm, I'm a big believer in the scientific method, Eric. It's, it's kind of funny. I was, I was literally a C minus science student in high school. Like I think that my science teacher, my junior year in high school gave me a C minus just because I was on the ragged edge of the D, but he felt bad for me and didn't want me to get too much trouble with my parents. So I think he like swung it over in the C minus as, as just to help me out. Right. But I have <laughs> since fallen in love with science, specifically the scientific method, because the scientific method is really a great way to live. And it's probably the best way to dream and vision and plan because a scientist walks into a lab and if they are following the scientific method, they first try to figure out what is true or not true, right? And then to say, how can we prove that to be true or prove that it is not true, right? And then they, they basically set out and they create a hypothesis of what do they think it's going to take to make this thing either to prove it's true or not true, right? And a hypothesis, if you look in the, in the Webster's Dictionary, the hypothesis is defined as a best guess, a well-educated guess. And I think that's probably the best definition for a plan as well. It's like, you know, we start to plan, we start to vision, we start to dream, we start to think about what do we want to do or achieve or experience. We start to hypothesize. We start to put a best guess together on what we think it'll take, right? Right. And then a scientist, if they're, if they're following through on the scientific method, basically what they do is they have their hypothesis, their plan, and then they start to experiment to say, all right, what do we think? What, you know, we think this is going to work, or we think it's going to go this way. Let's figure it out. Right. And what I love about science is there is no failure as long as you're experimenting and learning. And I think that same thing is true for life, especially if we can focus on that, right? Because what's beautiful about it is the only thing in science, only thing that, that really represents failure is stopping learning. Because an experiment, an experiment might help you to realize your hypothesis is totally off, but that's not failure, that's learning. That's, you know, and the last step of the scientific math method is to evaluate and adjust. And then you 
come back to the hypothesis and say, well, this happened or this happened. Now we think this. Now let's experiment again, evaluate and adjust. And it's it's really the perfect way to live. And you and I have talked about this. Like I, if I ever get to the point where I feel like I've got everything figured out, I am screwed, right? I've had a couple of times in my life where I thought, you know what? I'm pretty close to figuring this thing out. And then usually something would happen to completely convince me otherwise. And I just realized, you know, in God's great generosity, if I stay curious and I keep experimenting, mm. right, it's, it helps me to stay alive. It helps me to continue to grow and it's helped our business to evolve and change. And some of those, you know, things have come from things that I wanted to do or catalysts that I felt called to do. And sometimes they were that, you know, we've had to evolve and adapt because of catalysts that we couldn't control or didn't control. But if, as long as we keep experimenting and stay curious, this is an awesome ride. I love it. Nurturing curiosity. And I believe that that's such an important component of continuing to be this lifelong learner. And right. it's interesting because would you agree or, or disagree um, that uh, everything is our teacher and we're also teaching everything? Right. Well, yeah, it's, it's that that thing of going, okay, did this thing happen to us or for us? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> right? I love it. Like, yeah. you know, yes. Right? And, and so much of it is dependent then on uh, how are we going to label it? Like, how are we going to see it? Right. And I'm I'm a big prayer guy. I love, I love to pray. And, and it it's one of those things that helps, helps me to bring so much context. I honestly, some people will say, oh, that's weakness to have to pray. And I'm like, yep, I'm weak. Right. And we are all weak. We're all human. We're all frail. So it's like, you got to find those things that allow you to be strong. And to me, it's one of those, when I look back on some of those things, you know, some of the things that I wanted to label as adversity or pain, when I look back and go, okay, with a little bit of hindsight, so many of those things became gifts, right? They became the catalyst that moved me in a new direction. It became the thing that helped us to move in awareness or to go to a deeper level of emotion or connection and all those things. So on my best days, I can still get grumpy pants on. Don't worry. Like there are days where I'm still, you know, mad about everything, but those are pretty short lived. Um, I, you know, it's, it's truly, I think on most days I'm living a life of going, okay, bring it on. Let's do this thing. And, and, uh, it truly, uh, it, it has made for a pretty exciting adventure. Yeah. And I would, I would even say that, you know, prayer is the strength, the strengthening of resolve. Yeah. Um, and that resolve is that's cultivated within you then shows up outside of you. And it, to my from my perspective every moment is the prayer right it's the mm -hmm. way that you yeah. show up right so yeah. some people think that prayer is you know you need to close your eyes and meditate somewhere on the beach but or you know go to a church or do, but like really the yeah. prayer is is how you're treating each person in this current space and time. right it's it's constant right like i i i like the bible it's it's a mysterious document that's living and breathing for me i just love it and uh, it, and it helps to capture how messy and beautiful and complicated and wonderful humanity is right. Like, and how I, I believe we've got a God that loves us very much. Right. And it, it's one of those things. One of the most powerful verses in there talks about worry and, and it starts by saying, Hey, find joy all the time, like rejoice all the time, which I grew up a worrier. So the first time I heard that was F you like what, like who writes that kind of crap, but it is, it's, it's finding gratitude at all times. And then it says pray all the time, which I thought at the first time I read that, like who's got time for that. Right. But to your point, prayer can be those quiet moments, right? Whether it's on your couch in your office or in a church or at the beach or at a park, like I wholly and you know, fully recommend quiet times of intentional prayer. Right. But it is, it's it, prayer is that, that constant, uh, you know, conversation, I believe with God, but also like, what are you putting into the world? I, I love Ogmandino's greatest salesman uh, in the world. It's, it's a short book. It's a great read, 
but in in one uh, chapter called the scroll marked number two, he talks about, I will greet this day with love in my heart. And he says to everyone I meet, I will say, I love you not with my words, but with my eyes and with my heart. I will greet this day with love in my heart. And it, it's one of those things. I say that before I ever take a stage. I say that whenever, before I ever walk into a room. It's like, help me to greet this day with love in my heart and help me to say to everyone I interact with, whether it's the you know cashier at Target or the person on the road that cut you off or you know your team member or the client. It's like, help me to greet them with love in my heart and say, I love you. Um, you know, and to do that in a way that doesn't make people feel weird, but it, I tell you what, that's a game changer. Mm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a, it's so nice to hear this coming through you because I believe that a lot of people, uh, maybe most people they don't get to hear it often enough. Right. Sadly. Right. It's, it's revolutionary, but I don't think either one of us want it to be revolutionary anymore. Yeah, a hundred percent. And what's exciting is, you know, I, I'm curious is how are you or have you in the past uh, really integrated a lot of these teachings into major organizations like yeah. Nike, like NASA, yeah. like Disney? And what do you feel is... is the next stage of that level of congruent behavior uh, for the future. Yeah. I love that. So I, I think uh, I'm glad we can talk for four hours because this is so great. So I think, you know, when you, when you are paid to go and speak to an organization, right. Um, I always say, and, and this is true of any relationship, you want to honor that culture. You want to honor uh, kind of the boundaries that they set. And I'm pretty open with my faith on, I've got two podcasts. Uh, I'm pretty open about my faith and my faith journey on my podcast. But I also know that some of the organizations that I speak at, um, they they need to boundary, uh, you know, conversations about faith. Uh, it's amazing how that is becoming more and more open, more of an open conversa conversation, especially if you honor everyone at the table, right? It's if, if you're able to have a conversation that is, that is built on love and curiosity. And I'm excited to say that I'm seeing more and more of those as opposed to, you know, you see a lot of division on social media. You see a lot of division or, or at least what appears to be division, uh, you know, uh, from our different news sources and things like that. But I don't know about you, Eric, I, I, I would imagine it's kind of similar the more and more I'm in a room with people, like actual humans just talking, the less division I'm seeing, right? Mm -hmm. I, I The more I'm seeing of like actual humans getting curious about each other and honoring each other and staying open. Like, I don't know about you, but I want to be a force for that uh, because I do think that we are all meant to connect and talk and and learn from each other. We've all got stuff to teach. We've all got stuff to learn. So I, for me, I always say if I'm going into a, you know, a corporate situation or, you know, a couple of weeks ago, um, I spoke at a big conference. It was an association and they really wanted me to speak on worry and anxiousness. Then their industry is a really, it, obviously it's something that impacts all of us, but uh, they, they, uh, everybody in the room, I was in an industry that has a lot of stress inherent to it, at least in their minds. And so I taught for an hour and a half on how to overcome worry, how to, how to, you know, address anxiety. And oftentimes I would teach on wisdom that's thousands of years old. Now I know that wisdom is from the Bible, right? But I don't have to say it's from the Bible. It's to me, truth is truth. And it's one of those things that if it is truly true, then most people will actually see that as true. And I'm not worried whether people think I'm right. Like I'm not, I'm not trying to prove myself as right. I'm just trying to deliver information that might help. 
right? And then offer that to somebody and say, okay, how do you want to try this out? How do you want to do this, right? And and whenever I'm teaching, especially teaching from the stage or working one-on-one -on -one with a client, I'm also, I'm going to talk about the science that's behind some of this. I, I recently had an organization that was very open to me talking about my faith. And I went in and talked about basically the neuroscience between a particular, a kind of a very famous verse in Philippians 4, which is in the New Testament. And I broke down the neuroscience behind and the genius behind this scripture. And I was like, I believe God designed the brain. So why, you know, what if neuroscience is just kind of catching up with what the the writers of the scripture knew inherently, right? So it's it's one of those things I always say I want to respect and honor the culture of the organization or the stage that I'm speaking on. Uh, but at the same time, people want truth and people want help. So it's that whole thing of, uh, you know, I, I don't believe that that's like, you know, manipulation or hiding something. It's just like you find a way to deliver truth that can get through in a loving way. And most people are like, you know what? I'll take two scoops of that. Thank you very much. You know, so it's great. I love the um, component of, of really using, uh, you know, words from the Bible. And I believe that there's also, you know, a lot of other great scriptures that 100%. are able to yep. cultivate. Um, and it's beautiful when you read a lot of these different books um, you see some of the so many of the common blueprint and recognize the similarities of the stories in different ways yeah. in the patterns right and so this pattern then I realized it's like you know these patterns are really the ultimate responsibility of us to identify that we can apply this to our own lives. Right. Absolutely. And, right? and we can be learning from each other. I'll never forget. I wound up having this yeah. just incredible conversation with a Buddhist monk. And I love this guy. We would have these big, long conversations, but there was one time where we got into this big, long conversation on prayer and kind of what the experience of prayer is like for me, because I do believe that I hear from God and, and I do believe that, and that might sound crazy to sound like, but like for, to nope, some, but I have a know. feeling your audience will get it. But like, I have gotten really specific guidance or I have gotten really specific encouragement for a client or for our business. You can't really explain it away. Right. And so he, you know, this Buddhist monk is a, a friend was really curious about like, what's that experience like for you when you hear that? Because he also feels that as he, you know, would meditate, he would have experiences that would guide him as well. And so he was curious and I was curious, like, okay, what does that feel like? And how do you get there? And, and what happens if you've got a busy day and, and, you know, what if you're not feeling it? Do you always feel it? And he's like, no, I don't always feel it. You know I mean? It's just so beautiful, right. To find each other in the humanity of these journeys and not to try to figure out like if one is better than the other, it's just like, what's your truth pursue that right like and um yeah it's just kind of a beautiful thing do you find that when you were like uh connecting you know with nasa or uh, yeah. disney and the cultures within them that the the reason of their major uh, impact or their willingness to think outside of the box and the, the creativity what was one of like the catalysts in the way that they uh, ultimately refined their culture and the people that were excited to be there, or maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. Just yeah. No, no, no. It's a great example. So um, NASA, we wound up working with NASA. So we do a lot of, uh, you know, training on thinking bigger and creating more of a mentor culture, you know, question asking, more innovative thinking, what we call solution-based thinking, those kinds of things. So NASA actually had us come in because they were working really hard and they're pretty open about this. It's not defying any uh, confidentiality. Uh, they were working really hard because they realized their culture was broken in a way mm -hmm. in that uh, you know, in years past, in the 50s and 60s and the 70s, uh, basically, they, they didn't have to recruit. Like, everybody wanted to work 
for NASA. And then when you came to work for NASA, you basically were sweeping floors and doing grunt work for a decade. Like you were not getting any sexy projects. You were not going to be treated well. Uh, you know, you just basically were on that bottom rung and you would just try to learn as much as you could. And then maybe after a decade of working really, really, really hard, you might get one little, little crumb of something like a sexy, exciting project. And then it could go from there. And that was really the way they transferred wisdom uh, that you know they didn't have to worry about engagement. They didn't have to worry about because people just put up with it, right? Mm -hmm. And they realized that, hey, this doesn't work anymore. Yeah, uh, you know, as they saw, you know, millennials becoming more and more a part of the workforce, they realized millennials weren't putting up with it. And interestingly enough, you know, some of the people were grumbling about it, like this is, you know, they want something we didn't get. It's like, yep, because what you got was pretty crappy. You know, like, can we all just admit that that, and, and it's funny because everyone to the T when we would work with the exact, you know, the, the higher level leaders, they're like, yeah, it was terrible. Like, yeah. Would you want your kids to go through it? No, I wouldn't want my kids. Right. Exactly. So why don't we do something better? Right. Yeah. Um, and, and what's beautiful about that. And, and I always believe if you're going to go in with training, uh, you know, if you're going to try to impact a culture, one of those things is, you, you know, you've got to provide strategies that are going to work at work, but that could also be applied at home, right? Like globally, like, are these strategies going to be something that's going to make you better with your team, right? But are they also going to be something you can take home and, and, and work. And I'll never forget, we were doing a set of workshops and I would go in sometimes and do one workshop in the morning and do the same workshop with a different group of people in the afternoon. And uh, sure enough, we were doing that in the afternoon workshop. The guy that did my intro uh, had sat in on the morning session and participated in the morning session. And so he's like, guys, I got good news. I said, that, you know, he's like, this is Mitch Matthews, blah, blah, blah. Here's a little bit of his thing. And he said, the good news is the stuff he's going to teach you, you can use with your teams, but then you can take it home and use it with your teens. And it was so great because a literal rocket science, like, I, like this guy was a rocket scientist, raises his hand. You know, you didn't have the full like pocket protector in, but you could tell like wise, 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 super intelligent. He raises his hand. Like I haven't even started speaking yet. I'm like, yes, sir. And he goes, Hey, can we get to that teenager stuff? first. Cause I got some <laughs> stuff at home. Right. Like, I'm like, I love you, man. I got you covered. Don't you worry. We're, we, you know, we got you. And, and I do think like, if you're going to introduce stuff, it's gotta be stuff, uh, you know, oftentimes that they're going to be able to see and use globally. Um, and, and if they are, they're going to be much more apt to implement on it. And it's going to have, you know, a much greater chance of actually improving or changing the culture in a good way. And it becomes part of like uh, like uh, their nature, right? Because yeah. then if they're like, wow, I can use this at home or with my kids or with my wife or with my friendships, relationships, yep. it becomes the just like, wow. And then maybe perhaps, I don't know, you know, uh, it can be applied to any person they meet, you know? Like right. It, it That's exactly right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. So true. So true. It's a good way to live, right? When when you spend time uh, applying uh, these principles, what would you suggest to people uh, or within these cultures? Like, what does it mean to you? First of all, I have two questions off of this, actually. Yeah. Why is culture so important inside of organizations yeah. to you? To you and well, to these organizations. Or why do they see it as important? Maybe even better. And then how do you get them to actually integrate it in a way that allows them to really live by it rather than it just being like in the olden days, from my perspective, written on a wall or in right. their handbook or things like this? Absolutely. So I think interest, you know, culture is such an interesting thing because culture is a lot like air, right? <laughs> Air exists all around us all the time. Um, we don't think about it a lot, but if it's not there, we think about it immediately, right? 
or if the culture or the air goes negative, we start to think about it immediately and it starts to be all encompassing, right? So what's interesting about it is, is that first off, when you're training, uh, it, it, it's a little bit of making people aware of some things that's around them all the time, but also to be able to go, hey, how do we want to change it? How do we want to improve upon it, right? Um, and, and that can almost seem like almost impossible. It's almost seemed like grabbing at air. Like, how do we change culture? It's like, well, it's like, we'll grab a handful of air and then we can go, right? No, but to be able to say, hey, culture is the result of a set of behaviors, right? And a set of beliefs. And, and we can't change everybody's behaviors. We can't change everybody's beliefs, but we can change one thing. And that is how you interact with somebody today. And, and to be able to say, how do we start to change that? Now, what I, I'm a big believer in asking questions. I know that's what that's a big tool in your toolbox as well. And what I've found is that uh, asking questions um, is a powerful tool, but also when you're going after culture change, what it also allows you to do is it allows you to overcome something we believe that we call the intellectual immune system. And it's mm. that I believe our intellect has an immune system very similar to our body's immune system, not medically, but metaphorically. So, you know, when you think about how your, your body's immune system works, which is pretty miraculous, right? Like the idea that your body would be able to identify something that came from outside it and shut it down, whether it's a flu virus or a cold virus or whatever, pandemic level viruses, like your body's pretty good at identifying that stuff and shutting it down. At the same time though, like I had a friend who all of a sudden got very, very sick. Uh, the, the doctors figured out he needed a new kidney. His mom stepped up to the plate. She was the perfect donor. She was perfect match. They found one of the best surgeons in the country, right? Uh, he goes into the surgery. He knows he needs it. His mom's a perfect match. The surgeon did a flawless job. Even though all those things lined up, what did his body do anyway? It rejected it, right? Like he, it rejected his, that new kidney, even though it was a perfect fit, right? Now he is okay. They were able to overcome that. So just, that always that part always freaks people out. Like, how's your friend, right? But what's wild is, is that he, his body rejected that new kidney, even though he needed it, even though it was a perfect match, even though the surgeon did a great job, it rejected it because it came from outside him. I think we do the same thing with ideas. Even though we may need a new idea, even though we may need a new solution, if it feels like it came from outside us, we will often reject it. And there's a lot of data to back it up, but we don't even have to point to that data because I can just ask anybody like, hey, have you read a book in the last year, the seven habits or the eight principles or the nine whatever techniques? And, uh, you know, you thought, oh my gosh, this author must have a camera in my house. Like, how does he know me so well? How does she know my work? How does she know my office? And I'm so doing this, but like two days later, you can't remember what habits four five and six are. And maybe a week later, you can't even remember the freaking name of the book, you know, all that stuff. That's our intellectual immune system starting to shut it down, right? Say, ah, it's a good idea, but they haven't really walked in my shoes. They don't really know my team. They don't know what my client is like, mm. right? So to be able to say the way that we overcome the intellectual immune system, it's not impossible, but what you need to do is you need to overcome it by inviting ownership. What By what that means is uh, I like to, when I actually will present, I might throw out a set of three strategies, but then we'll take a break and, and we'll have some interaction and say, okay, guys, make them better by making them your own. Where would you apply these strategies? How would you improve these strategies for your team? And what's amazing about that is they can take my ideas, but the minute they start going, okay, how would we use this on Monday? Or how could we use this with this client? Or how could we use this on this project? All of a sudden, very quickly, it becomes theirs. And then I don't have to worry about the intellectual immune system anymore because they're all in because they feel like they helped create it. It's brilliant because you're 
applying the shoulders that we're standing on, like the books that we've read, the, the Absolutely. amazing scripture, whatever, you're applying that to the strategy in which you're holding them accountable into that air, right? Helping them yep. use the, with the stories, but by your own experience, with your own ways of communicating, and then allowing them through the space of resonance yep, and getting them to make it their own experience to yep. then take it on as themselves and recognize that they can, it's, it's almost like you're giving them the permission to say, oh, this story, you're like taking it, making it your own. And then they, and then giving them permission for them to take it and make it yep. their own. Yep. And then that's, it's, it's, that's often what's going to allow culture to change because it's not someone saying, Hey, you know, I think your culture should change. Therefore change it. It's saying, yeah. Hey, how can we use this tool to change our culture? How can we use this strategy to take our culture and make it better? Right? So it says, yes, culture exists, the air around us. Right. But to be able to say, okay, how can we use this strategy today? in some small but significant way to start impacting our culture? How can we make it better by making it our own? And then they're off to the races. How important do you feel that uh, thoughtfully disagreeing in that space and creating that safety where people can bring out their unique expressions fully without judgment yeah. is? I don't agree with that at all. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean by that, like, like, right in, in today's day and age, what's wild is equipping people to actually have hard conversations. Again, we're kind of back Amazing. to yet another topic that has become revolutionary and I don't want it to be revolutionary anymore. Right. But it is revolutionary to equip people with the permission and the tools to have a conversation where they can honor each other, right? To agree to disagree, right? To to like find out more by not just agreeing. You know, somebody the other day was talking and uh, we were talking about a mutual friend and they were like, I don't see how you can be a friend with that guy. Like, you know, you know what he believes? And I was like, listen, I have been married <laughs> happily to my wife for over 30 years. Do you think I agree with her on everything? Do you think she agrees with me on everything? No way, right? No way. Um, and it's one of those things like, isn't that what also makes life rich? Like if you're waiting around for me to only be friends with people who know exactly and, and agree with me fully, like I'm going to be alone. And I said, if you're going to have that life strategy, you're going to be alone, right? It's the richness. It's, it's funny. I used to, uh, when I was growing up, I felt, I grew up in middle America in the United States in, in Iowa, small town in Iowa, but I fell in love with England. And so I went and I lived in England the year after I graduated from high school. I went over and lived in England uh, because I got this really weird idea in my mind that I wanted to learn about American history because I loved American history. But I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to go and study American history, especially early American history in England? Mm. I wonder. I wonder how they teach about the American revolution, which is called the American uprising over there. Mm. Right. And so I found myself at 18 sitting in a class, uh, with a bunch of British students and an anti-American socialist professor, uh, in Abingdon, England, talking about American history. And it was taught from an entirely different perspective. Was it untrue? No, it was just being taught from a completely different perspective. And it was a year of learning about things and, and really kind of wrestling out what is true and untrue based on perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And how often the perspective changes everything. Like, how could that both be true and, 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 and false, right? Uh, just based on your perspective. And I'll never forget, I, I would hash out like, and in England, debate is celebrated. Like they take a Socratic method to over, almost every course, but she took it to another level. Like she wanted us to debate. And apparently I found out at 18 that I have a vein that pops out of my forehead when I get really like 
going on a debate. And there was one particular time my, my dad was a state employee of the state of Iowa. And she threw out this blanket statement that all state employees in America were corrupt and da, da, da. And I lost it. Da. We hashed it out. And, uh, you know, I almost didn't go back to the class. Right. But uh, I, as God would have it, and I think it was divinely timed, I'll never forget. I was walking down the hallway and walked past her office and her door was cracked. And I saw that she was sitting at her desk and I just took that opportunity to go sit down. Uh, cause we were about a week out from having this drop down drag out fight. And I just sat down and I said, Hey, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I want to know more about you. I said, I am sorry for some of the things I said, but I want to know more about you. Cause I said, it's, it's amazing. You know, so much about the United States, but at the same time, it seems like you do not like the United States at all. And I, I would just want to know more about you. And for whatever reason in that moment, um, I think, uh, again, whether it was divinely timed or what, she started to explain that she grew up loving the United States as a little school in an England or, you know, an English uh, school system. She loved America. She went to university, um, studied American history, and then went as her first job and taught at a private boys school in North, uh, in the Northeast in the United States. And for three years, she was beaten almost literally, but mostly mentally, uh, you know, emotionally by these students. And she went home hating the United States. I mean, you think about that, like that's your first position mm -hmm. out of school. You're on the other side of the planet. You had this dream and it became a nightmare. And I remember just talking with her and just going, I get it. I get why you don't like the United States very much. I, I'm, so, I'm so sorry that that happened, right? And what's amazing is we were able to complete that year. And I, I wouldn't say we were best of friends, but we were able to reach this mutual respect. She, I mean, she honored me by saying, hey, I also get why you're so fired up. She even complimented me. She's like, I've, I'm not seen, at that point I had turned 19. She's like, I'm not seeing a 19 year old so solid in their beliefs either, you know? So we were able to really find some mutual ground, some mutual respect. And we even had a little bit of a party at the end, uh, you know, to celebrate our journey together, all those things. So it's that thing of just getting curious and making space and, and knowing we don't have to agree, but we can certainly be agreeable as we're finding the right solutions. Mm. Do you feel this is, Part of, I believe, especially, and I like how you bring in the schools and the institutional uh, way of communicating in terms of uh, bringing up our future generation. Yeah. How do you feel uh, now with today's day and age and the responsible role? Because, you know, we know, you and I both know that these institutions uh, may be very, be, may be, very archaic in the way that they're teaching our children and our children's children. And so what do you think that we as leaders in the space or other leaders that may be listening or, or people that maybe are even uh, teaching at these schools yeah. that may be listening, what can we do all together to up level uh, the energy or the space or the way in which that we are listening even more to the students versus just teaching them our predisposed thought maps of the world. Right. Instead of offering a safe space for everybody to learn together. Like, yes, there needs to be direction. There needs to be a yeah. leader in these classrooms. But based off of what I'm hearing is how can we actually create a narrative even more for the experience of school to be like, you know, like an organization, like where it's a safe space to innovate or, or like a new yeah. organization, new world yeah. organization. Yeah. <clears throat> where we can really spend more time appeasing and understanding that the student of life, whether you're in inside of the university or inside of uh, junior high or inside of uh, elementary, you know, uh, 
that's what they called it in Canada. But right, right. having the curiosity as teachers to actually listening to the yeah. to the kids versus telling them our own perhaps mistaken belief systems because just because they're ours doesn't mean that it's a global belief. It doesn't right, mean that right, life right. is people are or I am, right? It, yeah. it gives people the opportunity. What do you think we can do to enhance that nature? Or I love it. can we do anything? Yeah, right. So I think one of those things is I, I you know, I'm not necessarily an expert on education by any means, but I, I'm wildly blessed to say, you know, I got education in the United States and then I had a year and a half of education in England as well. And I am a big fan of the Socratic method. I think that uh, it's so it's I just want to. Yeah, I need to I need to stop. I want to just challenge that. I believe that because you educate yourself and because you educate so many other people yeah. within organization, I believe, bro, that you are an expert in education. I because appreciate that. I genuinely mean that. And I want to just challenge it only because I see the uh, when we are curious as children ourselves. Yeah. As a result of that, that becomes the education that I believe yeah. gives the uh, offering for others to learn. Yep. I love that. And I appreciate that. I receive that uh, fully. So uh, what I would say in, in many ways is, is, you know, when you look at the system, right. Uh, you know, a lot of the systems behind a lot of the, you know, the world education system is, is kind of based on the industrial age. Uh, you know, you might say that a lot of kind of the classroom, uh, schedule and uh, how it lays out is, as some would argue, is basically getting someone so that they are optimized for working on a factory floor, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you could definitely argue that we need a major upgrade, right? And what I what I know, yes, right. What I know is that although the system, it's a little bit of the culture, right? Like the the air. There are some things that are are broken with the culture, but I would also say that, as you well know, there are innovators in every school I've I've been to. It's it's amazing, you know. I, I had a season where I did a lot of speaking at universities and colleges, and um, everyone to a T had some some people who were truly innovating doing things differently on their campuses. I see the same thing at high schools. I know we have uh, two boys that are, they're 24 or 22 and, and 24. And, uh, you know, I think back through uh, their education, they had innovators, you know, not every teacher, but there were innovators that changed. And what I love about so many of the innovators that I saw is so many of those innovators gave students the chance to experience things, right? They gave them room to fail, which is really, I, I think it's, it's hard for some teachers. It's also very hard for some parents, but to go, nope, the, the having the room to fail is inherent to learning. Right. And I don't know about you, but I learned a lot more from my failures and my setbacks than I did from my wins. Right. Um, to, to say, Hey, you know, I think back and go, okay, I do think my science teacher maybe gave me a C minus instead of a D, but I think that that also later on was like, huh, you know, that was one of the things that got me curious about science of going, you know what, this is actually, once I figure out how it applies to my life is wildly interesting, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I know for our boys, it's, it, uh, they were very creative. Um, they both actually had athletic ability, but they just weren't ever interested in the typical, you know, sports of, of, you know, kind of the middle United States, the baseball, the football, the soccer kinds of things that got into martial arts and different things. Um, but at one point, I was like, what do you guys like? And they're like, well, we like movies. We like our cartoons. And so on one Saturday, we made a stop motion video. This is when they were eight and 10. And I, I said, here's the thing is I'll help you shoot it, but you guys are going to storyboard it out. So I like walk through the creative process with them. They actually storyboarded out the story. And then we spent a whole day doing a one minute stop motion Lego movie. That was the one and only we did because <laughs> that was a lot of work. Then we shot another one that was more live action, lots of fun, right? Now, what's amazing is, is over the course of their high school careers, they actually wound up making 35 short films. Our younger son has written two novels. 
Um, he actually lives in LA now as an actor. Our older son is in the military, but he also writes scripts on the side, his option to couple of those scripts. And people ask all the time, like, how'd you guys, how'd you guys get your boys interested in that stuff? It's like, nah, we asked them what they were naturally interested in and then created space for them to create stuff. And were all of them good? All of those 35 short films, were they all good? No, some of them are hilariously bad. But I can tell you each one, they learn something like we can watch something and sometimes they'll cringe. They'll like watch through their fingers, but they can say, okay, that was terrible. But I learned this trick with the camera, or I learned how to take care of my actors. You know, the, the, our younger son, when he wound up, uh, he, the last semester, he took a class on filmmaking and, uh, he got his whole class involved. He wound up filling out. He got access to the big theater in their high school and showed a, a feature length film as uh, kind of his ending project. Everybody else was doing like five minute projects. He showed a feature length film to a stacked packed theater, got a standing ovation at the end, all these kinds of things. And it, it's amazing that that was possible because, you know, he didn't start there. He started when he was younger and just kept making those mistakes, kept learning and growing and it's made all the difference. So, yeah. And this, my brother, is why you are an educational expert. Okay. <laughs> so I just want to really emphasize that because uh, without our parents, I yeah. know from, and I speak for myself, you know, and I'm certain. Yeah. Uh, your ways would say the same is that without the ability to, without our parents and that infinite level of love uh, to really go out there and stand tall, go after what you believe in, believe that you can do it and really cultivate this place where ask better questions so that just because somebody is saying it doesn't mean that it's true. Yeah. Um, and, and really nurturing that level of curiosity and creating that space for your, your boys is what gives you from my perspective, uh, this educational expertise and also yeah. to be able to move forward. And, you know, I think and know and feel that the responsibility of our parenthood and our uh, family dynamic really allows us to bring those uh, values and principles into the community into the organizations and vice versa and the organizations yep. then bring that back into the family and so this is i believe how we move forward to really enhance our future for the next generations because we are all here for them yep. we're all here to really support them and make sure that we leave this place if we talk about integrity in the highest value and principles that we want to live by then let's leave this world behind better than we find it let's leave this yeah. relationship let's leave this friendship let's leave this yeah. space let's leave every dynamic every room better than when we found it and ultimately when we when we get to that destination you know to that last breath we'll yeah. be like wow we left it all on the table and yep. for you brother i am grateful because this is something that you're living, breathing, and being, and uh, I appreciate you for that because it's it's an amazing mirror to observe and pay attention to. So, uh, if anybody, my friend, wants to connect with you yes. and know more about how to uh, find your wisdom and reach out to you, where can they find you? What can they know? Absolutely. About? I appreciate you so much. Uh, so the best place to start is just go to mitchmatthews.com. Uh, that's kind of my overarching website that helps to capture almost everything that we do. So dream, think, do the podcast is there. Um, you can find out more about our resources. There's a lot of free resources there as well. So that's the best place to start and probably the easiest thing to remember. Amazing. And last question, brother, before we go. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, if you had three days left to live, what would you do? Hmm. Woo. That's a good question. You know, what's crazy is my, our, our younger son lives in LA. So I find a way to spend time with him, but it it's nuts, but I don't know that I do a lot different than my day to day. Right. I, 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 I would treasure the time with my family even more. I, it would be about the relationships I'd walk my dog. I'd, you know, 
I, uh, the last thing I want to do is like go to Disney or something. I, I want to just treasure those relationships and, uh, I, you know, try to be intentional with the relationships that I have. So I, I would imagine that if I knew I only had three days, I would be even more intentional, but it wouldn't be a wide swing from what I do day to day. And that feels pretty good. So I appreciate you asking that. Cause that's, that's a good question to ponder every so often. Right. Absolutely. We don't know, right. Uh, we can go tomorrow. So right. if we're living, if we're living in the moment and we're knowing that what we are doing now is what we would do with three days left to live. This is the answer that most people um, in my perspective should be living is yep. fully in what they would be doing if they had three days to live. It's so true. Can I share one last story to help punch that home too? Please. So I, uh, a number of years ago now uh, climbed Granite Peak, which is the tallest mountain in Montana. And we had a guide who was a friend of mine named Pete and two other guys were with us and we climbed, we summited granite peak and granite, not surprisingly is made out of granite. Uh, but <coughs> at the top, uh, um, a storm rolled in. And while we were at the peak, lightning started to strike, which hopefully you've never had this experience, but if you had that experience on a granite rock, it doesn't look like lightning's emerging from the clouds and coming down. It looks like it's emerging from the rocks and shooting up. Right. And we're, of course, we've got ice picks, we've got metal pro all around us. And, and, you know, we have to make our way off of this peak with lightning flashing around us, which, you know, has also has a distinct smell of sulfur. So some people will ask like, do you, what do you think hell will look like? I'm like, I know what it looks like. I know what it smells like, right? All that stuff. Now we lived through that, but we got down off of that peak, right? And later that day, Pete, our guide's best friend showed up with a dog. And now to get to Granite Peak, it had taken us two and a half days to hike there. And his friend shows up. His friend was an endurance athlete. He had run for 12 hours to get up there to tell us that Pete's son had been killed while going to get groceries, been killed by a drunk driver. Wow. So here we were doing something that some people would call crazy or dangerous, right? Um, and, and of course we were dancing around at the top trying to you know avoid lightning bolts. And his son just went to the grocery store. And it's, it was the ultimate reminder that you don't know. And, and so it's to be able to say, hey, we got to do the things we feel called to do. And some things that appear to be dangerous aren't, or they, they might still be, but that's a part of what's rich with life. But we don't know. To your point, we don't know. So we've got to take every day and treasure it. I think of that almost every day. We don't know. So we got to take every day and treasure it. Amen. Big love to you, brother. Super oh, man. For you. Absolutely. Thanks so much for the conversation and for what you're doing in the world, brother. Uh, I love it and uh, looking forward to more conversations. Hey, everyone, and thank you so much for listening to The Resilient Minds. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please make sure to go comment and like and follow us on iTunes or Spotify and make sure, please make sure that if you really love this, to share this episode and make sure that you're inviting all your friends to like it as we continue to unfold what the beauty of our minds does. More importantly, how powerful our heart level of intelligence can be when we combine our heart and our brain together. And more importantly, make sure you take the time to take a look at what we're doing at Balanced Media Ventures and how we can actually really support you in doubling your impact, your income, and your influence, and how you can bring your life's greatest vision into your purpose and create it from that level of reality. Talk to you soon.